To God be the glory. To God be, be the glory. We thank the choir for worshiping, leading us into worship, focusing our mind on a wonderful God. Thank you, choir. This, this sermon that the Holy Spirit has led me to, to teach and preach on this morning, uh, particularly for fathers, but it really is for all of us. And let me just go ahead and say, if you have not become a biological father, you still have a father role. Uh, it may be to that young boy who do not have a father in his life. You, you may be in positions where young boys are watching you. And, and we as men have a responsibility to be the kind of model for them. And I do make a distinction between just mere fathers and Christian fathers because there is a difference. So I want to go to a passage of scripture to not only challenge us this morning, but also to encourage us this morning, fathers, but also to women and those who declare that they are saved sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want us to go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And I want to read verse number 1 through 13. And I want us to hear it in the King James translation. Our text verse is going to be verse 9. Listen to what Paul writes under the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Here's our text verse. But ye are, look at the transition there, the contrast. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. 
Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, Ye shall live. Amen. Amen. And amen. I want to use as a sermon text to challenge us today, a sermon title to challenge us today. Uh, and fathers, I want prayerfully this will resonate in your mind and you will really examine closely to see whether you actually are in drunk with somebody. Amen. And the title I want to use is how can you know whether or not the Holy Spirit indwells you? How can you know whether or not the Holy Spirit indwells you. My brothers and sisters, particularly fathers, it is absolutely essential to have the Spirit of God indwelling in you. Because if you do not, you do not, the Bible says, belong to Christ. But how can you know whether or not the spirit indwells you? Anybody interested? Fathers, are you interested? How, how, how do you know? Is it a warm feeling inside of you or a tingling sensation? A woman once said to her pastor that uh, she knew that the spirit was in her church because when she came in the building, her hands tingled. The pastor said he wanted to suggest that she got a checkup with the neurologist. You know how some people, they say, well, I, I just saw something. I felt something. I had this, this dream. I just, I just say, well, maybe you need to check what you ate last night. There are distinguishing evidence, proof by which you can tell if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, fathers, if you are a declarer that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, you believe, you have faith in who Jesus is, He is God in flesh. Matthew records he's Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Christ, the anointed one. And please let us not get mixed up with everybody always saying I'm getting a fresh anointing. You only get one.
Christ means the only anointed one. And once you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, he sets an anointing simply means being set aside for the purpose and the use of Jesus the Christ who prayed that he would call will send back the Holy Spirit and he will take up residence. He will come and live inside every believer. So if that truly has happened, there must be evidence. There must be proof. It's not just saying, I believe in God through Jesus Christ. That, that is true. The Bible teaches that you must have faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. And God raised him from the dead, showing his power, as the text says, he raised Jesus from the dead. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, he imparts that power, that life into you. That's why he says he quickens you. The text says he quickens. That word quickens means made alive spiritually. So what that means that if, if, if we have been fathers made alive, there should be some evidence of the genuineness of our salvation, the genuineness of our faith that shows that we have been born again by the word of God and an act of the Holy Spirit. And fathers, we have to really, those who of us who say that we're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, we have to ask the question whether or not I'm in drunk with the Holy Spirit. Now, in John 3, after speaking to Nicodemus about the new birth, you know, Jesus said to Nicodemus when he came to him, you must be, you've got to be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of God. You all remember that? Some of you, you you've been reading the Bible. It's, it's John 3, by the way, you, you, you know. He says, he says, in order for you to enter the kingdom, you must be. It, it's a spiritual birth. Uh, he, 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 Jesus drew an analogy in that particular chapter between the effects of the wind and the effects of the Holy Spirit. What Jesus was really saying in his analogy is we can't see the wind. Anybody can see the wind. But we can see the wind's effects. When a piece of paper blows by, you do not assume that it is flying on its own like a bird, do you? You assume that the wind is blowing it, right? So it is with the Spirit. It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. You cannot see the Holy Spirit, but you can see his effects in one's life. So in Romans 8, Paul shows a number of things that the Holy Spirit does. In 8.2, Romans chapter 8.2, he sets you free from the law of sin and of death. We're no longer subject to the second death. The body is going to die as promised because of Adam's sin. But also, if you do not have Jesus Christ in your life, there's a second death that you will die. And that is spiritual. So Paul shows, shows that when you accept Jesus Christ, when you've been quickened, when you've been raised in Christ, then the body dies. The body dies to sin. But we are quickened, we're made alive in the spirit. He sets you free from the law of sin and of death. That's why we have victory over death, hell, and the grave. Not because of us. It's because of Jesus. 
He's already conquered death, hell, and the grave. Then we see in Romans chapter 8 verse 6. He gives new life and peace with God. We're no longer enemies of God. That word enmity, it means hostile, hate God. A matter of fact, that word enmity really suggests that, that a person that's not quickened, that person who do not have Christ in their life, do not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, hates everything God hates. Hates worship. Hates reading the Bible. Hates loving their enemy. Hate Jesus the Christ. Hates discipline. Hates coming under the authority of others. That's why some people say and some men say, some fathers say, can't nobody tell me what to do. If that man that father has not come under the authority of God then that son will not come under your authority neither that daughter but you have peace when you have peace with God then you can have peace with your fellow brothers and sisters also verse chapter number 8 verse 11 says the spirit will raise our mortal bodies he quickens the spirit live out the life of Jesus through these mortal bodies it is not subject to sin the spirit does not cause us to live sinful in these mortal bodies anymore before we were saved we, 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 we did some stuff. Anybody in the house? Any, before you got saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, let me see all the, 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 the saved by grace sinners. Now if, now, if you don't raise your hand, then you have not convicted that you're a sinner. Now, you may say, I never sinned. That's not what defines sinners. Sinners mean you were in the first Adam's family. You inherited sin from your first Adam daddy. He hated God because he had been disobedient because of not following the rules and, the, and, 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 and following the, 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 the instructions that God had given him because he yielded to Satan by disobeying God and I know some people want me to say Eve no he yielded to Satan but so did Eve but God gave instructions amen and that's why it says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish. That means shall not die the second death. And oh, my brothers and sisters, if you do not truly believe in him, you will die two deaths. But the one that's most, the, the, the most important one of the death, if you will, the, the, is the second death. Because all of us are going to die first death. You better teach your children that they're going to die. You better teach your children that you, 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 they're going to die and you're going to die. Don't let your children ever grow up thinking that mom and dad is not going to die. Teach your children how to deal with death. But also teach them what they need to do in order to not die the second death. Is there anybody in this house? Then jump. Romans 8.13, look at Romans 8.13, it says, He enables us to kill our sin. Talking about mortifying. Putting to death. Kill our sin. It 
instead of having a hate towards God, a father who has been quickened by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because of his faith and his trust in God through Jesus Christ, he no longer loves sin. He no longer desires to disobey God. He loves what God loves. He deny himself daily. Under the power and the control of the Holy Spirit. Then Romans 8, 26 says, helps us to pray. Fathers ought to be praying. Not just when you get up in the morning. That's good. Not just when you have your food, that's good. Not just when you go to bed at night, that's good. We teach our children the same thing. But it says pray without ceasing. One has to have an attitude of prayer. And really it means talking to him. Having a conversation with him. But if you're not connected with him, you can't have a conversation with him. Is there anybody in the house before the sinner? You need to understand for the sinner. People say, well, the only thing you have to do is pray the sinner's prayer. No, you have to believe in the way in who the sinner's prayer is pointing you to believe in and have faith in. Prayer just don't save you. Jesus does. So there's a active prayer life, frequent prayer life of a father praying for his children, praying for his wife, praying for his home, praying for the community, praying one for another. Prayer life. Then if you move, go, go back to chapter 8, of Romans verse 7 through 8. Listen to what it says. It says this. He says the spirit reconciles us to God. And enables us to submit to his word. And to please him. So what is the evidence and proof. Of whether or not the Holy Spirit dwells in, in you. Can I get the model please just for a minute. And I'm, all, I'm almost finished. Can I have the model on the screen please. What's the question that I'm asking fathers. To really contemplate and really examine, really look at closely. What's the question? No, I just gave you the title. Whether or not the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So, so, so we have the we we have the the model on the screen. It's there. Can we go to the natural person? Is that him? Thank y'all. That's the unsaved person. This is the person that's disconnected. This is the person that self sits on the throne. They desire to please self. The desires, they are focused on the flesh. The flesh is not the meat and, the meat and skin that's on the bones. It's talking about one's desires. One's affections, what, what really a person likes, okay? So the natural person, look at where self sits, sits on the, on the throne of their life. They, their, their desires is to get money, cars, uh, houses, uh, prestige, power. That's what they think life is really all about. Now, let me just go ahead and say this. There's nothing wrong with money, getting houses, getting cars. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the purpose of life. Money is, is not evil. It's the love of it. It's when I will do anything for it. When money becomes my Master, I don't have time for the Lord. When, when self sits on the throne, then one's purpose in life is to accumulate all of the attractions 
The natural person have no awareness of God in his life. That person does not really know God. The God that they know is self. The God of money. The God of power, prestige. The power of, of material things. That's what they know because that's what they have been really developed and influenced by the world. That that's what makes you who you are. So, so, so they produce arrogance, pride. They produce an elitist type attitude. They produce a, a classist attitude. So that's the unsaved person. They do not see themselves even accountable to God. They see themselves they can do whatever they want to do. Whenever they want to do it, however they want to do it. Fathers teach their sons the same identical thing. They can make them so materialistic that they will not grow up to know God. A matter of fact, there's a passage in Judges that says there was a, gener there was a generation that grew up that did not know God. And my question is, was that the generation fault? Because there had to be a previous generation. And if the previous generation didn't teach them about God, didn't teach them about the, 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 the Christ, if they did not exemplify the love for worship, the love for one another, then they grew up knowing idol gods. Why is it that our sons today feel as though that they don't have to really respect nobody? Not their teachers, not principals, assistant principals, not, not, not their mothers, nor their fathers. And the Bible says, children obey your, your, your parents, your father, in the Lord, for this is right. How many fathers are sitting down and teaching their children the word of God? How many are really sitting down, those who have small children? Those who have teenage children, because really by the time they get a teenager, they've, by the time they get five years old, they've developed their own personality. And if parents do not love God, they will not love his church. Then let's go to the second slide. That's the unsaved person. That's the natural person. This is the carnal person. Let me just go ahead and say, Paul says in chapter number 8, for to be, carnally, to be carnally minded is death. The synonymous word for carnally minded is worldly. Fleshy. Spiritually dead. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because that person has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the only way you can receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is you must receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because the carnal mind is, remember I said enmity? It means hostility against God, for it is not subject to the word of God. It is, not, it, 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 it is not accountable. Neither indeed can be. So then they are in the flesh. They are in themselves. They desire that what is most important to them. And they cannot please God. There is no such thing as a carnal Christian. Fathers cannot have self on the throne and Christ is not be on the throne. And so many fathers, I'm afraid, they have bought into religion. And not relationship. So they do religious activities, sing in the choir. Serve on the usher's ministry. Serve in the deacon's ministry. Come to church every Sunday. Tithe. None of those really indicate that a person is saved. What really is the evidence of salvation is how you treat, first of all, one another. How you treat your wife. How you treat your children. How you treat other brothers and sisters in Christ. 
how you treat those who do not know Christ. It's based on relation. The evidence is based upon the relationship. God says, Jesus says through the word, through the writers, he says, you say you love me who you've never seen before. And yet you hate your brothers and sisters. In other words, you don't want to get along with your brothers and sisters. You don't even want to, you, don't, you, you won't forgive them. So what is the evidence? This is not the evidence. The carnal person, because that person is worldly. Let's go to the next slide. Here's the spiritually immature Christian. This is the person who have come to believe and have faith in God through Jesus Christ. They're indwelt with the power of the Holy Spirit. What happens at this time, at the point of being born again by the word of God and the act of the Holy Spirit, none of us can come to Christ on our own. It must be under the conviction, the, the converting, and the compelling of the Holy Spirit. So look at where the cross is. Look at where the cross is. The cross represents Christ. Christ now takes the throne of a person's life. Self is being dethroned, being mortified, being killed. This person begins to understand that they have a change in priority. Christ becomes their priority. So if Christ becomes their priority, guess what becomes also their priority? Is love. What's the evidence? It's how you love people. He says, the Holy Spirit begins to produce. It's in Galatians 5, just in case y'all need a special of scripture. Galatians 5, around about verse 21 or 22. He says, when a person is changed, when a person is converted, it's not just coming down and saying, fathers, that I believe in Jesus Christ. But there must be evidence that the faith that you expressed, which was not on your own, it was by the Holy Spirit that you came to realize that you are a sinner. That natural person that I was talking about who only thought about themselves, who only desired what they wanted to desire. Now when the Holy Spirit convicts you, then he compels you to respond. And now he will produce the evidence, not you. And the evidence is not going to church. If you're saying, that's milk. That's milk. It's not just serving in ministries. That's milk. The real evidence is how you get along with people in the ministry. How you get along with people in the choir. How you get along with people on the, uh, in the usher's ministry. How you become the kind of father that will show the compassion and the love towards your sons and your daughters. How you teach them and lead them to Christ. It is the father's responsibility to lead their children to Christ. It is not the church responsibility. It's the father's responsibility. The church reinforces what the father teaches. If the father is not teaching them, the children will not know. If they never see the father come to the Lord's house, they will never, ever see it as being important. Amen. They see the father going to work every day. They know that's important. Because what does that mean? There's a, there's a, there's a cause and effect. Daddy goes to work. Daddy get paid. I get a bicycle. <laughs> Daddy goes to work. We get food on the table. Daddy goes to work. When, when it's time for a birthday, I get all these gifts. And they associate it with daddy. If daddy, father, does not help them make the distinction that the reason that I'm able to go to work is by the grace of God. If he does not help crystallize for that child or those children, that the reason that I'm able to provide for you is by the grace of God. Who's God, daddy? Let's sit down and talk about him. Why you go to church? Let me sit down and talk to you about it. Because daddy and father, they're going, to, they're, they're going to teach their children that they need to go to school, don't they? What will happen? That father's going to get up 
if in, 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 and I just encourage fathers, don't put everything on your wife. Take some time and take the children to school. Don't get that busy. Is that right? Amen. Amen. Help out at home. Wash the dishes. That's a way of showing that you are leading. Fathers are not the slave masters. Fathers are not the ones who dominate and become the boss. That's not what God has designed for you. He's designed you to lead. He designed you to show the way according to how it is as it relates to your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. To do it in love. Let me just go ahead and discount, discount, dismantle this. Fathers, don't provoke your children. Don't put your finger in their face when you get upset. Don't yell and scream. Be firm. But, but don't berate them. Don't belittle them. But children, you have a responsibility to obey your father. Whether, whether he's in your life or not. If your father walks up to you, you still have a responsibility to show that father respect. And let me just go ahead and say to the mothers, teach your babies whether that father walked out or not, how to respect the father. If you're angry with them, don't project that and displace that on the child. That's between you and whoever. But that child should never feel that he or she has to choose between that father and you. Come close. The evidence is based upon the relationship. Fathers, take your children to school. Let that child know. You, you, if that principal, if that teacher tells you to do something, it's like my voice telling you to do it. But we have fathers now. They'll go up to the school and they'll raise hell with the teacher about, is there anybody here? If your child is not performing academically, then go and ask for a conference with the teacher. But also understand your child is not going to tell you the truth all the time. Don't ever go up talking about my child never lie. Yes, they do. My child won't do that. Yes, they will. The evidence, does the Holy Spirit dwells in you? It's based upon the evidence of your love relationship with your wife, with one another, with your children. It's being able to have control of your temper. Amen. All right. I do anger management. I get so many referrals from the court system with young men who's had a problem with their temper. They either put their hands on the, on, on the young lady, whether it's their wife, or whoever. They got an altercation with somebody. Fathers, let me just say the evidence of whether the Holy Spirit indwells you is how you are controlled in pressure times. Please teach your sons that if they have a situation where they're being bullied or whether someone is, is challenging them by putting them down, tell your sons to walk away. Fathers, tell your sons to walk away. I know we've been trained old school that you don't walk away from somebody if they step to you and disrespect you. All men have basically come through that school some way or another, whether it's military, whether it's going into sports, whatever the case may be. I'm almost finished. But let me just go ahead and tell you, teach your son how to live another day. 
You don't know what these young people are packing these days. You don't know the beef that they will carry from one day to another. See, what we're thinking is that you resolve it right then and there. If I get the upmanship on you, then I prove that you don't step to me anymore. But let me just go ahead and tell you, Satan stepped to Jesus when he was in the wilderness three times. And then it says when Jesus did not yield to his temptation, Satan left him for a season. That meant that he was going to return, y'all. You got some kids today. You may think the beef is resolved, but they're going to come back another day. The only thing you don't know is how they're going to come back. Fathers, you have the responsibility of letting your child know you live another day. Walk away. Don't make you weak. It does not make you a punk. It does not make you a sissy. It does not make you any. It means that you have a spirit of discernment that hears your voice of the father saying, it's okay to walk away. We need fathers. We have too many of our sons being killed over just nonsense. Crazy stuff. You stepped on my tennis shoes. Because a father says to his son, don't let nobody punk you. Don't let nobody make you look like no sister. Don't let nobody make you look weak. You step to them. Fathers, teach them control. And if you're under the control of the Holy Spirit, he will restrain you. That's the evidence. That's the evidence. And, and he will evidence that with your wife and if you haven't gotten married yet he'll evidence it with your boo too amen the holy spirit if he truly indwells you he's not he's gonna also he's gonna restrain what you look at i gotta go y'all he, he's not gonna cause you to look at somebody or desire somebody and if you're married, is there, is your, your, come, see, I'm going to be real today because, see, we've got a lot of fathers, but they're not Christians, and they don't evidence the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He says, don't walk in lasciviousness. Lasciviousness means that you do not make gestures that's inappropriate towards another man's wife. You, you don't be an old man chasing these little young girls. A wink in your, that's lasciviousness. That's lewd, lascivious behavior. Teach, teach your children. Teach, your, help the, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit will help you set up boundaries around you. So when young cougars get up and they start saying, oh, you so little look good. I'm working out every day. The only one I want to say you look good, baby, is my wife. I'm, I'm looking good for her. If there is a lewd and lascivious remark made by somebody, I'm checking it. Fathers, you should too. The sin is not temptation. But if you allow that sin to began to infiltrate, began to cause one to lust, it will turn into action sooner or later. Is there anybody? Don't get into this flirting to my, well, you know, I was just flirting with her. No, you need to check that right away, Father. Don't teach your sons that in order, the evidence of a man is how many women you have. That's a slave mentality. Miss Master so-and-so not only had Miss so-and-so, but he had some mistresses on the side. We don't want to perpetuate that kind of culture. Not within our community. And fathers, Christian fathers, have to evidence that the Holy Spirit is indwelling them to the point that when you are committed to that monogamous relationship, you protect it, you guard it. We have to teach our young sons you don't become a player by how many numbers you get or how many digits you get 
we have to teach them the importance of relationship. Fathers, is the evidence of the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you? Is the evidence there? The love that you have for one another? The control that you have? The compassion? The peace? Does he live in you? A love for what God loves. And if you do not have the evidence don't allow Satan to make your heart so cold that you will not respond. The convicting of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that will convict and say he's not there. And if he is not there, the Bible says you do not belong to him. And I just want to open up the doors of the church this morning. The doors of salvation. I want to teach this because I didn't come to make nobody feel good. Because we have to know who we are in Christ. We have to know the evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He's not just going to lead you down a road that goes contrary to the word of God. We need saved, sanctified fathers who will lead our young men, our young boys, in the path of righteousness. Not in their own righteousness, but in the path of Jesus the Christ. And if you're here today, we invite you to come and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 